the, the chat box. And I'm just, again, really, we're really both glad that you're here watching. Um, and anybody that's going to tune in later, just know that this webinar is also going to be recorded for your viewing pleasure. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure it's recording, so just give me a moment. So hi, everyone. Um, we, I've got a lot of information to go through today. Thank you for joining us. And I'm going to start right away because there is, there's a lot of info. So I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. If you can, just say yes in the chat. <clears throat> perfect. Yeah, yes, perfect. All right. Um, let me... Okay. Oops. Great. We got lots of yeses. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. I'm glad you're here. This presentation will be a lengthy one. So um, again, if you're not able to stay the whole time, that's okay. It will be recorded for you to watch at a later time. Uh, it'll be up later on today, hopefully on my YouTube channel. Right now it's uh, streaming live on Dr. Susan Walker's Facebook channel. Um, so whenever you're ready, Susan, we're good to go. Okay. All right, so today's webinar is going to be on the moisture misconception and hopefully as I go along, you'll understand why it's titled that. And hopefully, uh, Krista, you can see my screen okay, right? Yep, I can see it. All right, perfect. So this, who is this webinar for? This webinar is for you if you're experiencing dry hair and it's dry no matter what products you use. And I understand that there are a collection of stylists and consumers. So uh, if you're a stylist, you or your, your clients are experiencing dry hair and you're not quite sure um, if the products that you're using are going to solve those dryness issues or you're not quite sure how to remedy the, the, the dry hair. If you're unsure of what to properly do, what to do to properly hydrate your hair, uh, if you use oils to moisturize your hair with little to no success, uh, you've been told that you're glycerin sensitive and that you shouldn't use it or you think you're glycerin sensitive because you've read it somewhere on the internet or someone told you this uh, and you're interested in the science of hair care and ingredients. So uh, the reason I put that is because my approach, the approach that I take is always going to be a science-based approach. I do know and understand that all of you um, and, and even myself, I will, I'll have opinions about certain things with respect to hair care. But what undergirds my opinion about hair care, hair care products is a science, is science. There is a science to hair. Hair is made up of um, scientific or ingredients or chemicals. You can't get around that. There's a science to hydration. There's a science to hair products. And so one of the things that I do, and I've been a, um, a cosmetic formulator for 10 years. So I have my own product line. And so as a cosmetic formulator, um, what I do is I create products. I have taken additional training and courses in cosmetic formulation and cosmetic science. No, I am not a cosmetic chemist, but I work closely with one. And so I always say to myself, okay, you know what? I don't necessarily need to be the cosmetic chemist, but I need to know some half of what she knows, right? In order to get the, the, the formulation the way I want it to be. And we go back and forth and we chat with each other and we bounce ideas off each other. And, you know, her, her knowledge is immense. And so I say all that to say that this is my vantage point is as a cosmetic formulator. I'm also a naturopathic doctor. I'm a licensed naturopathic doctor. I've been one since... Uh, 2004. Um, so for 15 years, I've worked in various clinics. I worked um, uh, in the corporate field, um, in a, a weight loss center. I left that because I didn't love it. I didn't love what I did as a naturopath with respect to um, the particular clients I was seeing and what I was doing. And so what I did is I uh, still maintain my license and my designations, but now I help people in terms of hair care and hair loss. And I did further training as a trichologist. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what a trichologist is, is a hair and scalp specialist. So I see clients who are experiencing hair loss, hair thinning, um, who have you know, health and wellness issues that might be contributing to their hair loss and thinning. And I'm able to help them with those health and wellness issues as well as with their hair loss issues. So that's what I do. This, I'm kind of a mismatch of a, a bunch of dis different disciplines, but I love what I do. And like I said, what undergirds what I do is always a science. So you can have opinions, you can read blogs, you can read charts and graphs and, and you know, different types of things on the internet, but what has to undergird it is science. And there's certain facts that you cannot change. And I know that we're in an age of, you know, not necessarily going with science, but going with gut and going with opinion. Um, but I still hang on to the science textbooks that I read. 
I still refer back to them to get to understand the why of why something is happening so that if there's any kind of aberrations, I can I have a foundation of why those might be happening. So that, that's the approach that I take. And that's the approach that the webinars that I that I broadcast take as well. <clears throat> so today we're going through hair science and chemistry. If you were on the previous webinar, you would have seen some of these slides. Uh, so I'm going to go through this uh, somewhat quickly. Um, to get to the meat and potatoes of the actual webinar. So I have my notes here. <clears throat> okay. So the hair structure is made up of two parts. You've got the hair shaft, which is um, what you see emerging from the scalp. And then what is beneath the scalp is the hair root and follicle. This is where the, the growth actually happens. That's where the magic happens. I don't want to spend too much time there. I just want to talk um, briefly about hair root and hair shaft. So the structure under the skin surface from where the hair grows is the hair root. <clears throat> So you see that there and the hair shaft extends above the surface and this is dead tissue. It's dead. So once it emerges from the scalp, it is dead tissue. This is what um, you're trying to, uh, I guess, make look and feel better through uh, various uh, products that you put on your hair. But with issues with hair growth, this is, we, we now have to deal with what's beneath the scalp, right? Because that is what is immersed um, with blood cells and bathed with hormones and that kind of thing. So that's where you're looking in terms of hair growth. Well, once the hair has emerged, how you're going to take care of it depends on what you're using. So the main constituents of hair is keratin protein, about 90%, lipids, 2 to 9%, water, melanin, and trace elements. So keep that in mind. Your keratin is about 90% of the hair. So again, we're looking at the hair shaft, and this is the part of the fiber that we see. Just move this over a little bit. It's not living tissue, and it's made up of three layers, the medulla, the cortex, and the cuticle. Now, if I have time later on the presentation, I'm gonna go talk about the cortex in a little bit more detail, uh, but for now, I'm just going to mention it. <clears throat> so the medulla is the innermost layer. It contains specialized cells with air spaces. It may be missing or broken in fine hair, and it's typically found in thick, coarse hair. I'm not gonna spend too much time on that one. The cortex is the thickest part of the hair shock. It's what makes up the bulk of the hair. And I think this is really important for you to understand, especially when we're, we're talking about hair products and we're especially talking about protein because I, I know that there's still a little bit of confusion about the whole protein issue, but it's responsible for the tensile strength of the hair. It contains protein, so it contains uh, keratin. It also contains melanin, which is the pigmented portion of the hair. And water is important for the cortex. And the cortex just determines the strength, resilience, and moisture content of the hair. The reason the cortex determines the strength of the hair is because of bonding. And I, I'm hoping I'll be able to get into that later. But going beyond the cuticle now into the cortex, there are bonds um, that are responsible for the strength of the hair. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later on. So I'm just going to talk about moisture basics, the laws of thermodynamics. Now, when I don't know a lot about something, I consult people who know way more than me. And so in this case, it was Tanya McKay, who was a chemist. And she points out that the laws of thermodynamics have a daily influence on the hair. And thermodynamics is the study of energy. And energy exists in many forms, such as heat, light, uh, chemical, and electrical energy. And everything in nature is always striving to reach a state of equilibrium or a state of balance. Um, and so with this example, what I want to show you is molecules will move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration until that energy balance is restored. So in this example, we have a, a drop of dye that's in, a, in some water. As you put the dye in, it starts to, um, to spread out throughout the water until all of the dye molecules are in a state of equilibrium with the actual water. So I just want you to, to remember this whole diffusion where a, uh, a, a molecule or substance will move down its concentration gradient from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So this is showing that in the example. So Diffusion can occur with solid liquids and, and, and gases, as I just said, and one of the molecules that this happens with is water. Now, water as a moisturizer, and most people will use moisture, uh, water on their hair to moisturize their hair. Water is required for moisturizing the hair, but on its own, it is not an effective moisturizer. 
Now, multiple studies on the hair show that the, the hair will take up water, but it will also lose water, especially if it's kept in the same environment that it was in before. Meaning that if you don't move in and if you're you know, washing your hair and let's say um, all things being equal, you don't put anything on your hair. So you wash it, you condition it, you rinse the conditioner from your hair, and then you step out of the shower and you just let your hair dry. What will tend to happen is water, that your hair will lose the water that it's taken up. That tends to happen. Okay, so you can try it for yourself if you're kind of skeptical and see that your hair does lose water to the surrounding environment. Now, what um, I want to talk about is humidity. Humidity and then cold environments because we know that water is necessary for the moisturization of hair, but how do we control things so that the hair takes in more water and the, and the water stays there. So this is really what this webinar is all about in terms of the principles of hydrating the hair. So with respect to humidity, humidity is the amount of water vapor in the air. And what happens is when dry hair is exposed to a humid environment, it will eventually become saturated with, with water. So when dry hair, hair that's dry, is exposed to a humid environment, it will eventually become saturated with water. Why is this happening? Because water is moving from an area of high concentration, which is basically the humid hair, air, to an area of low concentration, which is your hair. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to everyone. So the result in, is you've got moist hair that's prone to tangling and prone to frizzing. Okay, so think of your hair in the hot, humid environment of the summer. Another environment that we have is dry air. So in dry winter air, um, there is very little to no water vapor and a low relative humidity. And so what will happen, because we know that water wants to move down its concentration gradient from an area of high concentration to low concentration, is the hair will typically lose water and moisture to the atmosphere. Now keep in mind, I am making this statement, um, if you don't put anything in your hair to kind of counteract some of these effects, okay? So you don't put any conditioner, you don't put any oils, you don't put anything in your hair to counteract these effects. This is what is going to happen naturally. And the reason this is the case is because there's gonna be more water in your hair versus what the water in the atmosphere and, and to reach a state of equilibrium, water is gonna move down its concentration gradient. So the result is going to be dry, brittle hair that's prone to frizz, split ends and breakage. So, sorry, yeah, so there's something um, that some of the girls are doing, um, you know, on, on online, Instagram, what have you, and it's the um, no product challenge. So this is a great example of if you're not putting product in your hair, what may happen if you live in a dry environment? Yes. Like a dry climate. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. then what may happen if you live in a humid environment, right? Mm -hmm. So if you mm -hmm. live in a humid environment and you don't put any product in your hair, your hair could be a, a dry, I don't, I don't want to say dry. Your hair could be frizzy. Um, you won't have a lot of curl definition because mm -hmm. of the moisture uh, content mm -hmm. uh, moving from mm -hmm. the environment to your hair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. So there are key factors that affect water in the hair. And they're, the three top factors are humidity, heat, and porosity, with humidity being a key factor like I just, um, I just spoke about. Oh, OK. Can you see my screen? I can, yeah. Okay, perfect. I don't know why it says it's paused. Can everybody see my screen? Can you check the chat to see if... Um... Yep, people are saying yes. Okay, okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. All right, I, I just got a really weird, weird message. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I must okay. say that, that no product challenge was just for fun. It's for like, you know, one month of no product. It's just yeah. interesting that there actually could be a negative effect to not putting product in your hair. So this is great. Yeah, so when I put when I don't put product in my hair, I don't get this look. I because naturally my hair um, has a cottony appearance, so there's no curl definition. Um, there might be a few curls at the front, but it looks very cottony. So if I didn't put product in my hair, it would definitely look like that. Mm -hmm. So how heat damage? So I want to just talk briefly about heat damage. Um, we're going to talk about how heat damage um, can um, dry out the hair. So <clears throat> water begins to leave the hair shaft between 50 to 120 degrees Celsius, and that's about 122 Fahrenheit to 248 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is when water beliefs begins to exit the hair shaft. The hair proteins begin to break at about 155 degrees Celsius or 311 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And now as the temperature increases over 233 degrees Celsius or 451 degrees Fahrenheit, the keratin begins to melt. The bonds in the, in the, um, the cortex uh, start to be broken. That holds the hair structure together. They actually break. So in essence, if you're using high amounts of heat on your hair or using heat quite a bit, it damages the hair by reducing the moisture content and disrupting the protein structure in the hair and any damage can be cumulative. So that's one way that you can have dry hair is by constantly using heat on the hair. Okay, another way is, I'm having all these weird notifications. I'm sorry, everyone. It's all good. Normal healthy, yep. I can see normal healthy cuticle. Okay, just trying to move some stuff over. I was like me as I was drying my hair quickly. I thought, you know, I did need to speed up this drying process. So I had my, um, I had two blow dryers drying my hair. <laughs> I yes. was thinking as I was doing it, I'm probably <laughs> damaging my hair. <laughs> probably shouldn't do that. No. Probably shouldn't double fist with the blow dryers. <laughs> and again, if you're using the blow dryer every so often, it's not really a big deal. But um, if you're using it every single day on the high heat setting, then yeah, there could be some issues with respect to dryness. Um, and damage uh, because the, the keratin is, is being damaged, mm -hmm. right? So That's just something to point out. Yeah, I mean, I do it like once a week, so. Yes, right? yes. It's fine, yeah. probably, yeah. So the normal healthy cuticle. Um, so the cuticle is the outer portion of the, of the, the, um, the hair shaft. This is what protects the inner delicate proteins. And so a normal healthy cuticle is going to look smooth. It's going to reflect light. Um, Friction will be limited between hair shafts and hair strands. And this is important. It will typically absorb water quickly, but take longer to air dry. Um, so a, a healthy cuticle knows how to adequately maintain moisture levels. And typically the scales are tightly aligned. So that's a normal healthy cuticle. Now, a low porosity cuticle has a tightly bound cuticle layer and the individual scales and, and um, lie flat and overlap each other. Typically, this is the, the, the hair texture or porosity that can be resistant to chemical processing. And what I find with my clients who are low porosity, and I work mostly with clients who have really kinky, coily, tightly curled hair, um, what I find with them is that it takes a long time for their hair to get wet and a long time for their hair to get dry. This is just their porosity naturally. This is what they're born with. This is what their hair is. But this is a characteristic of low porosity hair. This hair also tends to be prone to product buildup. So even though uh, their hair needs a lot of product to actually feel moisturized or to get any uh, effect, like to get their curls defined, it is also prone to product buildup because their cuticle is so tightly bound. And so the hair can appear shiny and it's and is considered healthy. So I don't want you to think that if your hair is naturally low porosity, it's unhealthy hair. It is healthy hair, but it's just, this is the characteristic of your hair based on the fact that your cuticle scales are so tightly bound together. And you'll typically have more cuticles, more layers of cuticles as well. So a challenge with low porosity hair is definitely moisture, I find, because it, it, the, the cuticle scales are so tightly bound to each other that they don't lift up enough or properly or soon enough for moisture to get into the cortex. Moisture doesn't need to be on the cuticle. Moisture needs to get through the cuticle in the cortex because the water helps with the hydrogen bonding within the cortex. And then we have high porosity hair. And this is high porosity hair from damage. And typically it's the result, if it's damaged, um, from chemical processing, harsh treatments, environmental exposure, and heat. When I did the protein webinar, I went through all of the, um, the features of, of uh, damaged hair. And the increased porosity is one of them. And so when this happens, when your hair is chemically processed, um, if you have harsh treatments, if you have environmental exposure, and you have high porosity, as a result of that, there's irreversible damage to the cuticle. So there's nothing that can be done about this except for the hair to be cut, right, for a long-term solution. But however, in the meantime, this is where um, conditioning treatments and protein treatments can come in because they can help fortify the, the hair structure and patch up any weak spots in the protein structure until you're ready to trim off that hair. Now, the important thing about high porosity hair, especially high porosity hair that's damaged, is it absorbs a high amount of water. So typically high porosity hair is the hair that is going to get uh, wet quickly, but it's also going to lose water just as quickly. Okay. Would you say that there is natural, such thing as natural high porosity hair? Yeah. So for, for me as a type four, 
I naturally have as a characteristic of my hair, type four hair. That is, I'm just making a general broad statement because I know that there are exceptions to rules. Mm -hmm. um, and this is why, you know, doing, um, it's great that, you know, people do charts and graphs about this stuff, but there are exceptions to rules. But in general, type three and type four hair, the curlier hair and the coiler hair, the porosity tends to be higher. And this is not me saying it, this is researchers that, have, that have, are doing this, um, these studies that are indicating this. So yes, there is such a thing as that. And I naturally have higher porosity hair than perhaps you might as someone who's a wavy or curly hair texture. Mm -hmm. So it just, it, it definitely, the characteristics are definitely there um, based on your hair texture. But like I said, each person is different, right? So, um, no yeah, one size to, fits all. We, we yeah, no one size <laughs> fits yes. all for anything. So what I'm giving here are general principles to moisturizing, but based on your hair and what's going on with it and maybe based on the environment that you're in, you're going to have to tweak things a little bit, but I'm just giving you general principles to moisturizing your hair. <laughs> so, um, one of the, um, uh, blogs that I take a look at is, uh, the natural Haven. Um, she, is super super smart <laughs> on on these things having to do with hair i think she's a phd <coughs> excuse me so i would generally refer to her blog and get a lot of information and i really like this quote that she she said she said maintaining moisture is not about adding water into the hair but about creating a humid environment outside of the hair that keeps moisture or keeps water in the hair and i'm going to get into what that means a little bit later on but this is her quote that kind of sums up the key to moisturizing the hair very nicely because even though if you think about you know the no uh, product challenge and you're in a hot humid environment one of the things that shouldn't be happening to your hair is that it's dry it might be frizzy, you might have poor curl definition, but your hair definitely should not be dry because you're in a humid environment. Mm -hmm. So if we take this principle now and we apply it to how to properly moisturize our hair, you'll find that in, in any environment, whether it is you know, a mild uh, environment, cool, hot, cold, your hair should be able to maintain its moisture properly. So let's talk about how we make water a more effective moisturizer. We know we need water. We know we need water, but as we saw before, water can move in and out of the hair based on uh, uh, several factors. So how now do we take water and make it more effective at doing what it's supposed to do in terms of moisturizing the hair? And remember, moisture is required for proper flexibility and pliability to the hair, but also proper bonding within the hair structure. So when it comes to hydration, there are two things that I really want you to, to remember. You're trying to get your hair to hold on to existing water, and you're trying to slow the evaporation of water. And so I think if you remember these two concepts, then it will be a little bit easier for you to hydrate your hair. So you want your hair to hold on to existing water and you wanna slow the loss of water to the atmosphere. Water will eventually um, be lost to the atmosphere. There's nothing you can do about that, but we wanna slow the rate at which that happens. So how do we do this? We need moisture helpers. And so just, again, pouring over the research and taking a look at um, uh, ingredients for cosmetic formulation and ingredients for hair care, et cetera, and just pouring through um, different texts on uh, hair care. The key ingredients for hydration are the following. Water, of course, humectants, emollients, and occlusives. Now, water, self-explanatory, but humectants and water together, what they're going to do is they're going to help the hair hold on to existing water. The emollients and occlusive, and I'm going to talk about these in a little bit more detail, help reduce water loss from the hair. So I've identified the top four. Now there could be five, there could be conditioning agents in there as well, um, but the main ones are water, humectants, emollients, and occlusives. Okay, so what are these? Humectants. Humectants have been used for years in the cosmetics industry, and what they do is they attract water from either the atmosphere or the body in, case, in, in the case of uh, using humectants on the skin, and bind to itself via what's called hydrogen bonding. And this property is known as hygroscopicity, hy sorry. Oh, and it can be measured for any, that's a tongue, that's a tongue teaser there. It can be measured for any kind of humectant. Now, the amount of water that a material can bind at a specific humidity is called the equilibrium hygroscopy, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and this can be tested in a lab, 
okay? So this is science now. This can be tested on a lab. Now, the more moisture a humectant can absorb, the better it is for formulations. Now, the, the thing to keep in mind is that each humectant has its own ability to bind water to itself. So, in hair, it is used in products to moisturize, dry, or damage hair. And what it does, it, with respect to the hair, is it promotes moisture retention by attracting water molecules from the local environment and binding them to specific sites along their structure. So this is from naturallycurly.com. Um, they have a nice little infographic on humectants and the science behind humectants. And so you see here, you've got um, molecules are made up of different combinations of atoms. For example, water molecules H2O made up of three atoms. So you've got hydrogen, oxygen um, to make up the water molecule. And they also talk about polarity. Um, so molecules like water have a distinct polarity due to the oxygen being more electronegative than the hydrogen atom. So this is a lot of chemistry here. So what happens with humectants is they form a hydrogen bond. So the mildly negative oxygen atom is attracted to the mildly positive ox hydrogen atom in other water molecules and they move close to each other. They form a bridge called a hydrogen bond. Now, humectants, how they work is they have a, a polar hydroxyl group, which is an OH group that also favors hydrogen bonding. And when their humectants are applied to hair, styling, conditioning product, even, even a shampoo, because there's some evidence that humectants can actually be absorbed into the hair and don't just sit on top of the hair. They can attract water from the environment around them and bring, bring it in close contact to the hair. So essentially, when you use a humectant on the hair, you're attracting more water onto your hair and creating that humid environment. And you can see the source there from Naturally Curly. So um, how humectants work on the hair. So there is adsorption where something is being absorbed through the cuticle into the hair and there's adsorption or adsorption. And this is the process when atoms or molecules are attracted and adhered on to the surface of the hair. So they're not getting absorbed into the hair. There's some evidence that glycerin works by, or humect some humectants work by being absorbed into the hair, but they also sit on top of the hair and they stick on top of the hair. So this process happens via hydrogen bonding, and we, uh, I talked about that briefly. So when humectants bring water into contact with the hair, some can diffuse into the hair shaft, and what humectants can do is they can make the hair soft and supple, they can make the hair bouncy, they can uh, allow the hair to retain curl, and um, there's some evidence that it can minimize breakage as well. So, Glycerin sensitivity, fact or fiction. And I've heard this before, and I've had, I've had people even say, you know, glycerin makes my hair hard. It's not good for my hair. I don't want to use it. Um, so as a result, they say they're glycerin sensitive, sensitive. And is it fact or fiction? Well, the reality is it depends. And it depends on the environment. So the topic can be quite complicated, but it's important to note that, that for the sake of hair care and humectants, there are two main weather conditions. There are low humidity conditions and high humidity conditions. And in low humidity conditions, such as um, the cold, dry winter air, uh, what tends to happen is, theoretically, is that um, water can be sucked from the hair into the atmosphere. And, 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 you, and uh, the resulting hair tends to be dry and brittle. So if this is the case, if you find that you've used humectants in the winter and you've had dry, brittle hair, um, one of the things that's suggested is not to use products with a lot of humectants in the top five of the ingredient list. Because if you do use a product with humectants in top five, that means that that product is humectant heavy. And so in the winter time, if you find that your, your, your hair doesn't respond well to humectants, then you might want to use a product with humectants that are lower down in the ingredient list. Okay. So that's a great uh, general rule for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now I can say, that I found that I use humectants throughout um, the year. Um, and living in Canada, I, f I feel like there's only two seasons, even though there's spring, mm -hmm. summer, fall, and winter. I feel That's like right. we transition right into summer from winter. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we transition right into uh, winter from the summer. It's just so weird. Um, but what I, I use them throughout the year. And I find that depending on the environment that my hair is in, my hair will feel different. So I don't really chase, especially in the winter time, I don't chase moisture outside um, just because the air tends to be very cold and dry anyway. So if my hair is, if I'm going outside, I put a hat on. I put a satin lined hat on my head. 
or I'll put my hood on because I know that in the winter time, my hair in particular is, is going to be dry. If my hair tends to be dry inside, then there's something going on with the products that I'm using or the methodology or my regimen, or there's not enough water vapor in the atmosphere in, in, uh, indoors, but I don't chase it outside just because it's just not going to be, it's not going to be uh, moisturized. Um, so humidity and humectants in terms of the summertime. So this again is from Naturally Curly. So in high humidity conditions, Humectants may attract too much water to the hair from the wet environment. And this can cause the hair shaft to swell, the cuticle can become ruffled, your hair can become frizzy. And if you're using humectants that tend to bind a lot of water to themselves, it, your hair can become very sticky. Um, so in high humidity conditions, like the summertime, it may be best again to use products where humectants are lowered down on the ingredient list or use humectants that don't have a huge water binding capacity to them. So again, just another general statement, but I'll get into um, a, a little bit more information when I go through um, the actual humectants. I would say that that's just, oh. sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say that, that was probably, that's exactly describes my hair in Cancun last week. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the high humidity, loss of definition, dry. I'm still not, I'm still going to recover, have to recover from that for a little bit. A couple yeah. more washes, maybe deep treatments, that type of thing. My question for you, and that might be covered a little bit later in the, in the presentation, but um, obviously, uh, you know, switching out your, you know, top five where the humectants are in the top five. But what about also, um, again, using products such as like a leave-in conditioner that might be like a bit of a, I guess a leave-in conditioner might be in the humectant category that it's going to kind of put that uh, film, a little bit of a film on the hair to keep the cuticle down. Yes, um, and I do get into that, the types of products that you can use depending on what's going on with your hair. So yeah, I'll get into that a little bit later. Awesome. We'll okay, perfect. Um, okay, so dew points and humectants, and again, again from this infographic from Naturally Curly, which I think they do a really good job in, in kind of summing this all up. Dew point is the temperature at which the vapor begins to condense, and it's not to be mistaken for the amount of moisture in the atmosphere because humidity is the amount of moisture in the air. And so um, some people, some, some curlies will actually take a look at dew points to see you know, what humectants they should be using on their hair. So um, with respect to the information out there, a higher dew point means a higher concentration of water vapor and a lower dew point means a lower concentration of water vapor. And so when the dew point is 35 degrees Fahrenheit, the low moisture content in the air may cause humectants to draw moisture from the, from the, from the hair leading to split ends, broken strands, and flyaways. When the dew point is 35 to 50, these are optimal conditions for curls. There's just enough moisture in the air that the humectant can grab a little from the environment, which can enhance the curl and create a bouncy feeling to the hair. And when the dew point is over 60, um, it might be a good idea to apply some product with anti-humectant properties, because these products will seal in the hair shaft, flatten the cuticle, and prevent atmospheric moisture from absorbing into interior of your strands. Now, there are some people who really subscribe to this. I personally don't, um, just because I'm trying to make my, um, and not that, not that there's anything wrong with it, but I'm just trying to make my regimen very simple. So for me, what I know is um, in spring and fall, that's, those are the optimal times for my curls. My curls are amazing. But in the winter and the uh, summertime, not the optimal time for my curls in terms of the curl definition that I want. And I kind of deal with that um, accordingly. So I don't mind having super moisturized hair. So I don't mind having frizzy curls every now and then in the summertime. And in the winter time, I don't have, I don't mind having a little bit harder curls outside, but inside in the environment that I'm usually in, my curls tend to be softer. So I don't really take a look at dew points, but I know some people do. So I kind of included that for um, completion here. That's awesome. So what are some of the most common humectants? The most common humectants are glycerin, and there are, there are quite a few out there, but these are the most common that you're going to find in your products, and these are the most common that are um, used in the cosmetics industry. So glycerin, propylene glycol, sorbitol, sodium PCA, hyaluronic acid, and here's the proteins again, various hydrolyzed proteins have humectant qualities to them. So let's go through each of these um, and look at the characteristics of them. So glycerin is the most common humectant. It is odorless, it is uh, an odorless clear liquid. And actually most of these humectants are odorless and, and clear. It's sweet tasting and non-toxic. You'll find that in a lot of uh, supplements that are used for children, especially the liquids, they have glycerin um, as their base. So you're able to drink or take the glycerin um, internally. It can be derived from natural sources, but it's mainly manufactured as a byproduct of chemical reactions with fats and oils. So that's how it's manufactured. 
It's the most versatile humectant, but the problem with glycerin is at high level levels, it can be very sticky, but it tends to be a very good humectant because it really binds a lot of water to itself. So it has a high, hydro, high hydroscopic reading or, um, or value. So it's one of those high water binding um, humectants. So that's something to keep in mind. If you're looking for humectants and to use humectants in the summertime, you might not want to use glycerin because glycerin can really suck in moisture from the atmosphere and make your hair feel sticky and also frizz your curls if that's not what you're going for. So another common one used in cosmetics is propylene glycol. It doesn't absorb as much water as glycerin. It's similar to glycerin in chemical structure, but it's not as sticky. It's less expensive than glycerin and it's synthetically produced from petroleum processing. So if you're trying to avoid ingredients that are petroleum byproducts, then you might not want to use products with propylene glycol in them. But just know that if you see propylene glycol in your product, this is what it is. It's a humectant. And it's a, it's a, it's a pretty inexpensive humectant, which is why um, you know, a lot of cosmetic uh, formulators use it. The next one is sorbitol. Sorbitol is a six carbon sugar. So it's naturally derived from glucose. It is more hygroscopic than glycerin, but it's not as sticky. So what this means is it can bind water at a higher um, concentration than glycerin can, but you don't have that sticky feel to it. It's also more expensive than glycerin, um, but not as much as glycerin or, sorry, more expensive than glycerin. So I, I formulate with this product and it is very, very expensive, um, but I use it in one of my products to kind of cut um, some of the stickiness of the glycerin, but also offer the product a, a high uh, water absorbing uh, capacity on the hair. So yes, I can, I definitely know that sorbitol is expensive. And um, sometimes it's in a liquid, but I purchase it in a, in a powder format. So if you're gonna use sorbitol, it's gonna be in a powder, you wanna add some water to it and then add it to uh, a spray bottle or whatever if you wanna spritz your hair with it and try that. All right, butylene glycol is a clear liquid and it's similar in humectancy to propylene glycol. And for those people who don't wanna use propylene glycol, um, this is considered from a cosmetic perspective to be a good substitute. Sodium PCA. Sodium PCA is more of a naturally derived humectant. It is naturally found in skin, um, highly effective, and it can bind water one and a half times better than glycerin. It's one of the best performing humectants, but it is very expensive. Again, I formulate with sodium PCA so I can attest to the expense of it. Um, and it's got, it's almost like a salt-like um, flavor. So it's not like um, glycerin that's sweet, but it is very good at binding water to itself. It tends to not be as viscous, but again, an expensive, um, an expensive uh, humectant. And last we have proteins. And just, um, just to review, uh, proteins are made up of single units called amino acids. They're joined together. Um, and this molecule on the right-hand side, you see this is a protein molecule. And each of the individual circles is an amino acid that makes up that protein. So typically how proteins are used in cosmetics is that full protein is not gonna be useful because it's too big. So they have to be cut into um, you know, either the individual amino acids or two or three amino acids. And this is called hydrolyzation of the protein. So it's unchaining that long protein strand into smaller chains or amino acids and breaking those bonds so that the protein can be useful for the hair. They can either attach onto the cuticle or be absorbed through the cuticle into the cortex to kind of fortify the hair structure. Now, when it comes to moisture, proteins can act as humectants and help with moisture retention. And they can also provide the hair with conditioning. So there's another benefit of using proteins as well, not just for the, the, the sake of helping to repair the hair, but adding some humectant qualities to, to the product. All right, so you've got your humectants, great. The next set of ingredients, for uh, moisturizing the hair is occlusives. Now, occlusives increase moisture levels by providing a, an actual physical barrier to water loss. And so they're typically from oily materials that create a coating on the hair, like it's a physical coating on the hair. These are ingredients that are not soluble in water and they're typically lipids with long chain molecules. The most um, well-known occlusives are um, petroleum byproducts, okay? Like petroleum and mineral oil. Um, what the occlusives do is they slow down the rate of water loss from the hair. And as the hair tries to leave your hair, sorry, as the water tries to leave your hair, it hits the barrier and starts to accumulate within the, the hair structure. So 
the occlusives are mineral oil and petroleum. And I realize that a lot of people might not want to use these um, ingredients on their hair, which is completely fine, but I just want to put it in there that some of the best known um, barriers, like physical barriers to prevent water loss from the hair are the occlusives. Now, back in my day, when I was younger, uh, my mom used to, um, my, my grandmother used to use hair grease on my hair all the time. It was just petroleum and mineral oil. And then you've got your Vaseline petroleum jelly. So because a lot of us don't want to use occlusives, we can kind of create a, a, a barrier by using another type of product or a combination of products, humectants, polymers, and emollients together. So instead of just using the occlusives or using humectants and occlusives, we can take out those occlusives, so take out the mineral oil products and petroleum products and blend humectants, polymers, and emollients together into a formula to create a great product that helps to prevent water loss from the hair. And to do this, we've got to talk about the next set of products, which are called emollients. Now, the term emollients is used for ingredients that are able to soften the skin. So in the context of, of um, what the word was originally intended for. But in cosmetic formulation, um, the word emollients are ingredients incorporated into products to improve the feel of the skin and the hair. And they can come from natural or synthetic sources. So most um, natural emollients are called triglycerides. And they come from plant and animal fats and oils. And they're made up of three fatty acids attached to a glycerin. So right here, the diagram on the right, you see glycerol, you see three fatty acids, and then they come together to form what's called a triglyceride or three glycerols. So what are some characteristics of um, glycer uh, triglycerides? Well, um, they're characterized based on their melting point, the oily feel that they contribute, because not all triglycerides are created equally their compatibility with other ingredients and their ability to penetrate the skin and the hair because not all triglycerides are created equally. Not all triglycerides are able to penetrate into the hair. Not all triglycerides are able to penetrate into the skin. So they're classified um, uh, based on these characteristics. So what makes a triglyceride different? What differentiates triglycerides from each other? They're differentiated by the fatty acid distribution. This is what is responsible for the differences among triglycerides. And I, when I say triglycerides, I'm talking about your oils and your butters. So your coconut oil, your sunflower oil, your safflower oil, your castor oils, your, your marula oil. I'm talking about all the oils and the butters and all the great products and great ingredients that are going into your hair care products that give, it a, a, give your hair a softness. The fatty acid distribution is responsible for the differences among triglycerides. Now, fatty acids are hydrocarbons with varying numbers of carbon and hydrogen atoms. And different triglycerides will have differing fatty acid compositions. So what you see, this image that you see down here is a long hydrocarbon chain. So it's got carbons and it's got hydrogens. And it's got what's called a carboxylic acid group. This is basically a backbone of a triglyceride. And depending on the triglyceride, you'll have various um, various double bonds, single bonds, lengths of change, etc. So types of fatty acids. When it comes to fatty acids, so if we take a look at this chart, your fatty acid is broken down into a saturated and unsaturated fat. I'm going to get into what this is in a little bit more detail. And your unsaturated fats are now further broken down into your monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. And this is important. Okay, so I just really want you to keep this in mind that this is important. So you have a fatty acid, you've got saturated and unsaturated, but then your unsaturated fatty acids are broken down into mono and polyunsaturated acids, unsaturated acids. Now, fatty acids are beneficial for health, for taking them internally, absolutely. But right now I'm talking about fatty acids in the context of using them on the hair. Okay, <clears throat> so saturated fats. These include fatty acids that do not contain a double bond in the molecule. And they're most often white solids. Now there are exceptions to the rule, but they're most often white solids. So what main, what really popular um, fat do we know that is, is, a, is a white solid that like everybody uses? Coconut oil, right? Mm -hmm. So, 
On this chart, we've got examples of fatty acids. Fatty acids have a systematic name, a common name, a formula, a symbol. Don't worry about this stuff over here, like the common name, formula, symbol. You can find these charts online if you're interested, and I think they will be very useful if you're trying to figure out what types of oils you should be using on your hair for what purpose. But you have caprylic acid, capric acid, lauric acid, mer meristic acid, palmitic acid, et cetera, et cetera. These are the fatty acids that are going to make up the particular oils that you're going to be using on your hair, okay? Now, an unsaturated fat includes fatty acids containing a double bond, and it's usually colorless liquids. There are exceptions to the rule, but that is how you can identify an unsaturated fat. So how do we identify a saturated fat? They're usually white at room temperature. Um, and unsaturated, unsaturated fats are usually colorless liquids in general. And these are the unsaturated fatty acids names. Um, palmitto oleic acid, oleic, elietic, uh, petrosalinic, et cetera, et cetera. So again, you can find these charts online. Uh, if you search saturated fatty acid names and unsaturated fatty acid names, they'll come up. Okay. Now, remember I said that you're further subdividing unsaturated fatty acids into mono and poly. This is important. So mono unsaturated fatty acids are those um, that tend to have one double bond. So they're unsaturated because there's a double bond in the structure, but mono meaning one, one double bond. It includes the omega-9 fatty acids. And again, we've got some of the names of the, the fatty acids here. I'm not gonna spend too much time on that for now. Now we get into the polyunsats, poly meaning more than one double bond. And these will include the omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. They have at least two double bonds and have at least 18 carbon atoms. Okay, why do we care about all this? I'm sure you're asking, why does this really matter? Because not all oils are created equally in terms of helping the hair maintain moisture, okay? Some oils can be absorbed into the cortex, making the hair more manageable. And these are what you would call your penetrating oils. Some oils repel water, slowing the entry of water into the hair or the exit of water from the hair. And these are your sealing oils. Now, what does the research say about this? A few articles published about the effect of mineral and vegetable oils on the human hair. So what does research say? In this article, and I cited it here, you can go take a look at it if you'd like. It's from the Journal of Cosmetic Science um, back in 2003. It's the effect of mineral oil, sunflower oil, and coconut oil on prevention of hair damage. This study looked at the properties of mineral oil, coconut oil, and sunflower oil on the hair. Coconut oil was the only one found to reduce protein loss from the hair for both undamaged, undamaged hair when it was used as a pre-wash and a post-wash product. So it was used before they washed their hair and after they washed their hair. Coconut oil, in terms of the oils that were studied, was the only one that was found to reduce the chipping away or the protein loss from the cuticle or, and even um, uh, within the, the hair structure when it was used in this way. Sunflower and mineral oil did not help in reducing protein loss. Why is that? Um, and the difference could arise from the composition of each of these oils. So let's take a closer look at these oils. Coconut oil is a triglyceride that is mainly made up of lauric acid. Remember that chart um, that I, a few slides ago where I, you showed the, the, the um, fatty acids, the different names of the fatty acids? Coconut oil is about, I think, over 50% lauric acid. Lauric acid is special in that it has an affinity for hair protein. Um, and coconut oil, coconut oil, the structure of coconut oil has a low molecular weight and a straight change, chain. Once you start getting those double bonds in there chemically, it, it, makes, it, 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 it causes curves to the actual um, fatty acid chain. So because of the straight chain of coconut oil, it is able to penetrate inside the hair shaft. So what are some of the benefits of penetrating oils? Well, in this study specifically, um, it can reduce the amount of water absorbed into the hair, leading to a lowering of swelling. Why do we care about this? Because this constant swelling and drying cycle can lead to what's called high growth fatigue, which can actually damage the hair. 
Coconut oil or penetrating oils can fill in gaps between the cuticle cells and prevent the penetration of harsh substances into the hair. So for example, if you use coconut oil as a pre-shampoo treatment, if you use it as a pre-shampoo treatment, and then you use a shampoo with sodium lauryl sulfate in it or sodium lauryl sulfate in it, let's just say you do, what that coconut oil can do is it can prevent the penetration of that sodium lauryl sulfate into the hair and mitigate that, the damage that can occur from using a, a shampoo that might have a harsh uh, cleansing agent in it. It can enhance lubrication of the hair shaft and prevent breakage, and it can add suppleness and pliability to the hair. So non-penetrating oil. So from the study, this is the, these are the conclusions from the study. The mineral oil, which is a hydrocarbon, it does not penetrate into the hair. Sunflower oil, well, you're saying, okay, Susan, it's an oil, but it doesn't penetrate into the hair. No, it doesn't. Because it is a triglyceride of a linoleic acid, which is mostly a polyunsaturated fat. And what that means is it has a bulky structure and double bonds. Because of this, there is limited penetration into the hair fiber. This oil does not reach the cortex. Oops, does not reach the cortex. Both oils, the mineral oil and the sunflower oil can create a film on the hair and attach onto the surface of the hair. And this film can enhance shine and, and reduce friction. But these oils do not get absorbed into the hair. So the conclusions based on these, this study, and there's a few other studies that were done that show the same thing, saturated and monounsaturated oils diffuse into the hair well and act more like penetrating oils. Whereas your polyunsats do not diffuse into the hair as well and act more like sealing oils. Okay, so the chemical composition of some oils. Okay, with this chart, and again, this is based. This is a chart that was based on a research paper. There are other charts that you can get online, but I just want to um, go through this chart quickly. Um, so argan oil at the top. Uh, mostly, and this, the number beside it in parentheses, this is the percentage of the component in the actual oil. So argan oil is mostly made up of omega-9, okay? And what was omega-9? Was it mono, unsat, or polyunsaturated? <clears throat> Anybody? Krista, you remember? Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm answering questions here in the background. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> No, I do not know the answer to this question. Please tell me. <laughs> okay, let's go back. Oopsie, let me go back. Let me go back. Let me go back. Let me go back. Your monounsats, omega-9, include, include your omega-9 fatty acids. And what do monounsaturated fats do? Can they be absorbed or do they sit on top of the hair? Krista. Let's see. <laughs> Sorry, I've been behind the scenes answering questions. So okay, so <laughs> a lot coming in right now. <laughs> okay, so right. your monounsaturated oils are going to act like penetrating oils. So for this one, the argan oil is going to act more like a penetrating oil because it's high in omega nine, which is a monounsaturated fat. If I go to avocado oil, avocado oil has about sixty to eighty percent omega nine, and so again, this is going to act more like a penetrating oil. I'm going to go to cocoa butter. I love cocoa butter. Cocoa butter is going to act more like an omega, uh, a, 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 it's a monounsat, um, a monounsaturated fat. It's going to act like a penetrating oil, which kind of might to you seem kind of counterintuitive because you think that the, those solid at room temperature oils are the ones that seal, but it has to do with the fatty acid composition. So it's not about someone's opinion here. This is now science that's saying because of the structure, the chemical structure of the oil, that chemical structure allows it to get absorbed through the hair or sit on top of the hair. And again, uh, safflower oil is mostly omega-6. So this is going to act more like a sealing oil. So let's go through some. And again, we've got some of the, the palm oil. Palm oil is definitely um, a penetrating oil. But some people don't like to uh, use palm oil because of the sustainability of it. So penetrating oils. This is not a complete list. So definitely do your research if you want to add more information onto this list. But uh, um, olive oil. Olive oil is going to act more like a penetrating oil because it's mostly mono, some poly, mostly monounsaturated though. Avocado oil is mostly monounsaturated. Coconut oil is a saturated oil, so it's going to act more like a penetrating oil. So all of these are going to act more like penetrating oils. 
Now, I would say, even though um, the research says it will add more like a penetrating oil, if you use it and you find that it seals in moisture for you, then that's what it does on your hair. But I'm just giving you generals here so you can to, to kind of lay the foundation and then you can kind of do your own research on the meaning purchase the, these um, oils, use them in, in a way where you think it's going to work. So if you're using olive oil or avocado oil, you would use it as a penetrating oil on dry hair, not wet hair, right? Or not, uh, not damp hair. You use it on dry hair. The sealing oils I would use on, on, um, on wet hair because you're sealing in moisture, right? So try using all of these oils on, damp, on dry hair. See what the effect is that you get. Try mixing them together um, and see what you get. Okay, but all of these oils are going to act like penetrating oils. They're going to help um, increase the elasticity of the hair. They're going to help the hair be more supple and more pliable. Now, sealing. Moisture can be sealed into the hair. It will evaporate after a while, and this depends on many factors such as the initial exposure to water, how much oil and the type of oil um, is used, the temperature, the humidity, the porosity. So there's so many factors that um, determine whether or not your hair will lose moisture. Just keeping that in mind. But these are the sealing oils. And again, not a complete list. There are definitely more, but these are some of the more uh, common ones. So argan oil, um, safflower oil, argan oil actually was the omega-9, sorry. That would have been more of a penetrating oil. Sorry, my, my apologies there. Based on the, the chart we had before. Safflower oil, macadamia oil, passiflora, almond, moringa, there are tons more, but these would be the oils that would consider to be sealing to the hair or sealing in moisture. So with respect to products for hydration, in any environment, um, in order for your hair to remain hydrated, a combination of products with the following ingredients should be used. So water for sure. You might want to use some conditioning agents, which as Krista said uh, before, um, kind of seals the cuticle. Humectants and emollients. Now, I will say that depending on your hair type and texture, the, the type of humectant, the type of emollient you use is going to be different. So my um, experience is more on clients with type 3 and type 4 hair, so really kinky, coily hair. And clients with this hair type and texture tend to have drier hair. So for my clients, they need... Um, more humectants or ingredients or, or, or um, humectants that are that have more water pulling uh, capabilities than other humectants that don't. Um, they need uh, oils that have more of a sealing in uh, property. So just keep that in mind that I'm just giving generals here, but then tweak it based on your hair. <clears throat> so the, the products you may use include any of the following, <clears throat> excuse me, shampoo, co-wash, <coughs> Oh, Susan, are you there? Uh-oh. Can't hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, oh can, there you yeah. Are. yeah exactly. Sorry. <laughs> I was like, um, stop the press. <laughs> <laughs> the products you use may include any of the following. So shampoo, co-wash, deep conditioner, leave-in conditioner, or moisturizer, or an oil. You might have to use all of them or just some of them, but just keep in mind that this, these might be the types of products in your arsenal for helping to hydrate your hair. So if there's one product that is essential for do, reducing dryness and for optimal moisture, it's what I like to call a moisturizer. But before discussing moisturizers, I'm going to look at the differences between rinse out conditioners, leave-in conditioners, and then what I'm going to term moisturizers. So rinse out conditioners are usually uh, made to deposit onto the hair to temporarily repair, soften, and strengthen it. And they're going to be rinsed out. They'll typically have a higher concentration of conditioning agents because it's the conditioning agents that really help to soften and detangle the hair and what deposit onto the hair. Uh, Leave-in conditioners and moisturizers are designed to add a little temporary softness and make the hair easier to manipulate, but they might not deposit much on the hair in order to avoid buildup. So your leave-in conditioners will have, might have some conditioning agents in them to detangle and soften the hair, but not a high concentration because you don't want the products or ingredients to build up on the hair. Now, like I said, usually, because it all depends on the manufacturer, it all depends on the, on the, the product formulation, but just in general. So how conditioners work, um, just a quick discussion. So conditioners typically contain ingredients called surfactants that attach onto the surface of the hair. Um, 
shampoos contain surfactants as well, a different type of surfactant than conditioners do. And conditioners typically contain positively charged surfactants. The hair has a slight negative charge. So we know the opposites attract. So when conditioning agents attach onto the hair, they do so at sites that have a, um, a um, little bit more of a net negative charge. And that's typically gonna be damaged hair. And the reason this happens is for the conditioning agents to stick onto the hair to do what it's going to do in terms of softening, depositing any, um, any uh, you know, other um, uh, ingredients onto the hair so that when the hair is uh, rinsed with water, some of the conditioning agent might be left back, right? And then you have softening of the hair. They help to repair the hair, they help to smooth the cuticle, reduce tangling, ease wet combing, and provide the hair with softening. That's what the conditioner is supposed to do. So functions of conditioners is to improve uh, combability, to mimic the hair's natural lipid outer layer called 18-MEA. And I know I didn't discuss that in detail. I'm not going to. That's a, another webinar. But that's uh, one of the things that conditioners do. Restores the water-repelling properties of the hair. Um, as the hair gets more and more damaged, it tends to be more um, water-hating, um, so more lipophilic. Uh, sorry, lipophob um, It tends to be more lipo hydrophil hydrophilic sorry so you want to restore my apologies i had a brain fart there um so you want to restore the water repelling uh, properties to the hair which can um, vanish or be uh, minimized as the hair gets more damaged it helps to seal the cuticle um, it helps to avoid uh, or minimize frizz and friction it neutralizes the net negative charge on the hair and enhances shine smoothness and manageability so your conditioner is supposed to do a lot there's a lot that your conditioner is supposed to do so part of, like you asked before, part of your hydrating strategy could be the use of leave-in conditioners for sure. Um, and like I said, leave-in conditioners will generally do all of what I mentioned before, but just maybe to a lesser extent, meaning they're not going to have as much of the conditioning agent in it as a rinse-out conditioner because you don't want buildup on the hair. So um, some curlies will use the lock method, uh, leave-in oil and cream. So the whole premise behind this is to layer on product. And as you seal in one layer, that um, adds more moisture or helps the hair um, you know, retain moisture better. So you have a leave-in product, and then you have an oil on top, and then you have a cream on top of that. There are variations of the LOC method. I, again, I don't use this method at all. Um, I'd like to keep my regimens as, 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 as simple as possible. I just find that a lot of these things are just way too complex for me and I don't need to do it based on the products that I use. But there are variations in the lock method. You've got a liquid leave-in, an oil plus an oil-based cream or a DIY shea butter mix. You can do a liquid leave-in plus oil plus water-based cream or butter or a liquid leave-in oil gel styler for wash and go. There's zero, different variations. Again, I know that we try to simplify things with respect to hair care by using charts and graphs, which is a great foundation. But I think that as you start to care for your hair, you'll find that some things don't work and other things do work. And so what I'm trying to do today is just give you general principles of, um, of, of moisturization. So I'm going to, it's already two o'clock. I'm going to end here. Um, Krista, do, are there any questions? Oh um, boy. Oh boy. Are there ever. <laughs> <laughs> and again, my perspective is um, the kinky, coily, coily hair. Krista works with wavy and curly hair. So what she is going to use or what her clients are going to use are going to be different from what my clients are, are going to use. But the principles are the same. Mm -hmm. Think about it, Krista. Agreed. Um, okay, so first question for you. Dr. Susan Walker is uh, flaxseed uh, are very high in fats. Would flaxseed gel be considered an emollient? Flaxseed gel, um, or flax, yeah, gel made out of flax seeds. Would it, would those? Yeah, yeah. With the with the gel with the flaxseed, and I used to use flaxseed um, in my gel before. Um, you're actually boiling, and you're taking out the mucilaginous substance. I don't think you're getting straight to the oil. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be more of a um, a fill form, a film former. Mm -hmm. So a film former, what it's going to do is, it, yes, it's going to deposit on the hair, but it, what it's going to do is it's going to help clump curls together, which is what film formers do. Um, so I don't think it's going to be more so much of an emollient as it is a film former to help with curl definition. So for that, you would want the flaxseed oil, mm -hmm. and that is a essential fat. And in that case, it would act more like a sealing oil than a penetrating oil. 
Got it. So two different, two different things we're talking about. There's yes. flaxseed oil and then a flaxseed gel. The flaxseed, the mucilage from the flaxseed, because um, it does, it does give like a gummy kind of substance when you mm -hmm. boil it. Great. Um, so the next person um, suggested that they might experiment with mineral oil on their next wash. Do, would you advise that to experiment with mineral oils or I, Yes. And I would, okay. So I would say. <laughs> General, generally speaking. I would say that. Your use of certain ingredients depends on your philosophy, your hair care philosophy. So if you're a person that does not want to use any synthetic ingredients on your hair or try to be as naturally derived as possible or not use any petroleum uh, byproducts on your hair, then you would not use mineral oil. But if you're a person that doesn't mind using various um, raw materials or various ingredients, no matter what the source is, even if it is a hydrocarbon, then yes, you can experiment with using mineral oil on your hair. You would use it. I find the best way to use it is on damp hair or wet hair because you're sealing in the moisture. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to say yes or no. It just depends on your philosophy. Sure. Right? Yeah. Yes. Do you have a suggested amount to use if someone wanted to try it? It depends on your hair sure. texture, your curl pattern. So like for my hair, I would use more than someone who has finer hair. In mm -hmm. fact, if someone had fine hair, I wouldn't even suggest mineral oil a lot at all say. because yeah. it would weigh the hair down. So it just depends. That's, yeah. I'm sorry, I can't be more help. Okay. But but the more, the more curly, the more kinky the hair, the more likely they more might density. have success. Yeah, density. exactly. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Good. That's great. Um, next question. How does aloe vera compare with glycerin? Okay. So aloe vera is a humectant. Aloe vera. And, and the thing is, is that because I, I formulate with aloe vera juice all the time, it is one of the ingredients in all of my, every single one of my products mm -hmm. because of the humectant properties of it. Um, and you want to use, when you're formulating with aloe vera, um, it's not necessarily the gel. The gel it can be, the gel it has humectant properties, but you have to, you have to know how to use the gel if you're taking it specifically from a plant. Mm -hmm. So I would say the aloe vera juice would be what you'd want to use. Um, you can maybe dilute it or add it to some distilled water in a spray bottle with a little bit of glycerin to mm -hmm. have like a supercharged humectant spray. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, aloe vera is definitely very good. Um, it has great humectant properties. I've, I've seen uh, Natural85, she's on Instagram, YouTube, yeah. but she uses a spray at nighttime to kind of, a spray like that, to hydrate her curls before she goes to bed. Yes, and I think that is a, a that's the advice I give to all of my clients. That I, And it's just my own personal philosophy that your nighttime prep um, cause my clients have to do a lot of prep. They do a lot of twists outs to their hair. Um, they might do braid, but, um, do braid out. So there might be some nighttime prep. They might have to be moisturized. So I tell them to do that at nighttime versus during the day, because I just found that, and there's no like real scientific evidence for this. This is just an observation that I'm making that your hair retains moisture better. Um, if you do your prep at nighttime, than if you do it at, in the daytime, in the day, um, this is just what I found. So especially if it's protected by maybe a, like a, a sat sat line cat. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I guess the uh, mm -hmm. question coming from the stylist side of things is I heard once, and again, it's a, a assumption, but if you're spraying more water on already kind of sealed hair that really the hair can't get any more extra moisture in is, would you say that that's incorrect? Um, I would see, I don't know if it's incorrect. I just, I would just think that if you're spraying water onto hair that let's say is sealed by a gel, mm -hmm. when you spray the water on the hair, you're messing up those bonds that are created as the, when the gel dries. Mm -hmm. So you're frizzing it even more. I just find that for my hair and for my clients, Spraying hair with water leads to drier hair and more frizz. Mm -hmm. Now, again, each person's hair is different, right? But the clients that I'm dealing with, I, I don't advise them to use water. I actually advise them to use steam. Okay. Steam actually works so much better, I found, in terms of moisturizing and hydrating and, and, um, and allowing your hair to be refreshed than water does on specific clients. So right. I have a Q Redo. I love it. I absolutely love my Q Redo. Um, I found it excellent for detangling the hair and just refreshing the hair without water. And there's water. A, found that there's a difference. Yeah, on, yeah I agree. Yeah. I agree. Awesome. Okay. Uh, next question. Are silicones also good occlusives? Cause we didn't talk a whole lot about silicones today. No, I didn't talk about silicones because of time. Um, and so I, I do understand that there's definitely a lot of questions about various uh, ingredients. Um, but I knew that this particular 
moisture webinar was going to be long and so I didn't include the silicones because it was it, it would make it longer um, so silicone it just depends on the silicone is not is going to be an occlusive agent or it's going to be a conditioning agent and trust me I'm going to talk about silicones in the next webinar mm -hmm. but for this one um, I had to kind of pick and choose what I wanted to discuss because of the length of it so I will talk about that the next one. Yes. Got it. Okay. The next webinar, um, and I was just, I was talking to Krista about this beforehand. I think I'm going to do on, um, on hair care products and ingredients because um, it's just been my observation and just from feedback and questions that I received after the last webinar that there's just a poor understanding of products, what the, what the products you're using are supposed to do and what the ingredients are. And so um, I'm hoping that this next webinar will kind of teach you to look past the marketing claims made by product companies to what the product actually does. And in order to do that, you've got to know hair care products and the ingredients that make up the product. And I'm going to spend some time doing that. That I think that will help quite a few of you. Mm -hmm. um, just because I've received emails and, and um, from people who um, you know, wanted me to take a look at an ingredient list and thinking that our product contained protein when it didn't. Mm -hmm. And so again, it just goes back to knowledge on ingredients and again, being a product formulator for 10 years, this is, this is what I do. So I can speak to that and kind of, you know, bust some myths there with respect to product ingredients. Awesome. But yeah. I will address that, I promise. Okay, cool. Um, next question. I've heard that Babasu oil is a good alternative to coconut oil because it's also high in lauric acid. Lauric acid. Bang. You're, you're right. Absolutely. There's, yeah, you're absolutely right. In fact, um, I tell people who might have a, 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 a true allergy to coconut oil because some people might have tree nut allergies uh, and coconut oil might not be a, an oil that they can use. So I tell them to use Babasu oil. Another one is Muru Muru Butter, M-U. M-U, M-U-R-U, Muru Muru Butter. Um, that's also a good alternative for coconut oil because of the hyaluric acid content. Just keep in mind that those butters are very expensive. They're like tropical, um, <clears throat> you know, found in like a, a South America as well. They're very expensive and Got very it. expensive alternative to coconut oil. Um, kind of a second part of that question, is fractionated coconut oil also an effective pre-poo treatment? I would say no, because it's only three, I think it's only three fatty acids. Okay. So I would go for the actual, you know. Straight up. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I recently read that repeated use of coconut oil may cause protein buildup, making hair stiff and less elastic. No, there's no protein in coconut oil. Right. Because we, there's a, it, there's something that looks like a protein, but it's actually that we discovered it was a, was it a fatty acid in coconut oil? Right. right. So, the so last webinar. Yeah. Right. So with respect to, you know, fats, carbohydrates, proteins, carbohydrates, the building blocks of carbohydrates are glucose with proteins. The building blocks of proteins are amino acids. And with fats, the building blocks of fats are fatty acids. So there's no protein in fats in a fatty, like the fatty acid structure. It's a fatty acid. Okay. There's no protein in coconut oil. Now, yeah. if you have the milk, the coconut milk, there might be some protein in there, mm -hmm. but with the fat that's extracted, it's a fat. Got it. Yeah. Awesome. So it's going to be built, it's going to be made up of fatty acids, not proteins. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure where that information came from, um, but again, nope. <laughs> no, not, <laughs> not, not, yeah, wrong. Um, what, how long do you feel coconut oil needs to be on the hair as a pro poop? pre-poo treatment to be um, effective. I suggested, you know, somewhere between 30 minutes to an hour before your shower, or if you have time, you could sleep in it overnight, maybe. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. That's okay. exactly right. So based on the research, it was 30 minutes. You could definitely do longer, but yeah, yeah. 30 minutes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, is shea butter also penetrating? I think you shea ended butter, up covering that. Yeah, I did. Shea, shea butter from what I... Um, Yes, it's a it's penetrating because it's mostly unsaturated. Sorry, hold on. Yeah, this is mostly it should be mostly saturated and mono. Got it. That should be saturated. So yeah. Okay. Perfect. <clears throat> um, also, uh, someone was wondering if they use coconut oil as a pre poo, and if it didn't get all fully washed out, would it cause more harm than good? I think it would just make the hair stringy. More so than what was the question? Sorry, just before I answer that, I'm just going to oh, go. Yes. So you see here in this chart, yeah, um, saturated um, fat, thirty to forty percent, and then we've got um, oleic, the OA, which is omega nine. So it's mostly saturated and omega nine. So yes, it's going to be a penetrating oil. Awesome. Just want to confirm that. Perfect. 
Um, so you're, so you're, yeah, so, sorry, I jumped ahead there. Uh, so if someone used coconut oil as a pre-poo treatment and it didn't fully get washed out, would it cause more harm than good? And my no. thought is that it would just make the hair look stringy in terms of like the styling on it, my hair, on a wavy haired person, mm -hmm. it would make the hair look stringy, possibly greasy looking if it didn't get fully washed out. Yeah, it could make the hair look stringy. Um, and again, it depends on your hair. I know I use, I use on my hair, Mm -hmm. I use products with heavy oils and butters and my, my hair needs it. So it depends on your, your hair texture, curl mm -hmm. pattern, type, density. Mm -hmm. um, so on, yeah, on Krista, your, on your hair, it might look stringy or it might not if it doesn't get completely washed out, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you never know until you try it, but there's not going to be any harm to the hair, no. Right. Well, then well, try it. It's fine. The only thing that might be build up. Right. 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 Yeah. 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 So the option is basically to try it, try it a few yes. different ways and see which hair you're like, your hair, which way your hair likes it best. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, how the question, how do you feel when the oil is penetrating? I'm, I'm wondering if that's like, how does the hair feel when the oil is penetrated? Yeah. Would it feel more moisturized? Yes. Yes. Um, <clears throat> just speaking from my own experience and dealing with clients, I, I deal with a lot of clients or see a lot of clients, <coughs> excuse me, that have a lo low porosity hair. Um, but because they, they're not familiar with how to moisturize their hair, they end up putting more oil on their hair. So what it actually feels like is oily, dry hair. Mm -hmm. so, there, so that tells me that the oil is just sitting on top of the hair and it's not really getting absorbed in to increase the, fly, the pliability and the flexibility of the hair. So you can still have greasy, brittle hair. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if oils are not penetrating into the hair and you don't have the, and that's, this is what I'm saying. It's not just about the oil. It's about the combination of the humectants and the oils and perhaps the conditioning agents that mm -hmm. kind of work together to increase, uh, to improve moisture retention in the hair. Mm -hmm. You'll have hair that is dry, but oily. Yeah. Right? Rather than hair that feels moisturized from the inside. That's mm -hmm. the only way I can describe it. Yep. There's a flexibility and a pliability to the hair. That's how you know that the oil is actually getting in and doing something within the hair structure. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would say as a stylist and from clients sitting in our chair, I would say that we see quite a few people coming in kind of new to the, you know, the whole curly method. And, and if they've been using a lot of, of butters and oils on their hair, it does feel, it does look greasy and it is dry feeling. So then yes. you, you're teaching how to actually, you know, cleanse or strip away kind of the buildup, hot, properly hydrate the hair, and then again, seal it in with different products and not saying that you can't maybe use oils and butters, but you got to know how to use them. Yes. And yeah. the purpose of, of um, them in your hair. Yeah. Like I don't use, <clears throat> excuse me, the only time I use an oil by itself is if I'm doing a pre-poo treatment. Other than that, I use, a, I use products that have combinations of oils, butters, humectants in them. So I don't just uh, use an oil to seal in moisture just because the products that I use have penetrating and sealing oils and they condition and they soften and I, and I don't need the additional steps. So this is why I, I made a point of saying like the general principles of hydration are to use products that have a combination of humectants, emollients, perhaps conditioning agents, or perhaps you can, you know, create your own kind of um, do-it-yourself mixture or spray. Some people will use um, an oil and water mix. What's missing in that mix is the humectant. And oil and water don't mix together. I mean, you need a right. solubilizer or um, something that will bring it together if you want to get technical. But if not, you just mix it up and spray it on your hair. But what is typically missing from so many people's regimens is the humectant. And you don't have to have a lot of it. Krista, you were saying that you, are, you tell your clients to use honey. Honey is also a, a humectant. Mm -hmm. um, so what are your results with telling your clients to use honey to, in their spray? Uh, and it, it really, well, ultimately, and some clients, say, and again, depending on the por porosity or porosity, I can never, I don't never know how to say it properly, <laughs> but the, um, basically, you know, even just the tiniest pea sized amount of honey mixed in with the gel into the hair is normally how I'm telling them to use it. I um, mean, it makes such a difference in how much definition they get. So they've got better definition. Their curls stay intact better. If you use too much honey, your hair will feel sticky. So that's mm -hmm. the whole thing about, um, I noticed that you were saying that, you know, gliss vegetable glycerin has a sweet taste. The sorbitol has a sweeter taste to it. So that, you know, honey is kind of sweet. So, and again, if used in too big, large amount, will make the hair feel sticky. That's totally true with honey. Yes. So again, just tiny pea sized amount, and it can make a big difference with how well your hair um, stays together throughout, you know, your wash, you know, between, between now and your next wash cycle, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. 
Um, so those are great questions. We've got a lot of questions, so I'll try to get through them here. But um, ne next question is, how do humectants attract moisture into the hair if it's sealed with a sealing oil? Uh, they're referring to the LOC or LCO methods that are commonplace in the natural hair community. That's a very good question. I wonder the same thing too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this, is why, this is why I'm not necessarily subscribing to it and I'm, and I'm not saying it's bogus either because I know that some people who use the LOC method, they get results. But to me, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and I put it up because a lot of people, and, and again, with any method, it's, it's if you're new to the, the curly hair world or natural hair world, um, you want a system. You want a system of, of how to do something. And, and this system was created. Um, to me, when I analyze it, it doesn't make any sense to me. I would say that the oil, and especially using a sealing oil, would be the last thing that is actually used. And you would do the water and a water glycerin mix first. Then you could use your oil on top if you want to, if you want to, if you're not using a cream-based product. And again, the cream-based product that someone uses, what does it have in it? Um, I find that a lot of people and a lot of uh, manufacturers don't use a lot of humectants because of the stigma within the community of, you know, shouldn't, you shouldn't use humectants on your hair. Well, who said that? I, I use humectants on my hair with great success. I find that's the missing, one of the missing ingredients in a lot of these products or, or humectants that have a high ability to bind water to the hair. And so what you find with humectants is they soften the hair. They're amazing, amazing ingredients. So I agree with this, with this, um, the person that's asking the question, it doesn't make any sense, um, which is why I, you know, I don't necessarily subscribe to it, but I don't want to dismiss it either mm -hmm. because some people get success with this method. Sure. So I'm just putting this up there here showing that this is what is out there. There are variations on it, but I personally don't follow this. Mm -hmm. um, I follow, you know, uh, I, uh, for my hair personally, I use um, a, a leave-in or moisturizer that has a high amount of humectant in it. And then I'll use a gel on top with also has a high amount of humectant because my hair loves humectants. And, and right. I just found that for really kinky coily hair, humectants are key um, to yes. moisturizing. Yeah. Um, someone mentioned that they find that uh, they have 3B hair, a lot of kinks. Um, shea butter tends to make their hair feel waxy. So I'm not sure if they're just like literally taking sh real shea butter and putting it on the hair. Yes. Yeah. Um, is that possible that shea butter could make the hair feel waxy? It could because, I, I, I mean, I'm assuming that the person is melting it first mm -hmm. um, before they're putting it on the hair just to make it spread better. But then you've got to think that shea butter does, it does, I don't want to say dry, but it does solidify again. Um, which is another reason I don't put um, butters um, on my hair just as is. I kind of mix it with other ingredients because they do they do solidify. When they solidify, they can have like a a, a, a waxy coating on the hair just because it, at room temperature, stay butter tends to be solid, right? Mm -hmm. The same That's thing right. with uh, coconut oil that some people say it makes their hair hard. Well, it, it probably will if you put it directly on your hair. Um, and you don't mix it in with other ingredients, um, if you put it directly on your hair, it will solidify, mm -hmm. right? So again, there's a way to use it. The way I use coconut oil is as a pre-wash treatment, but I don't use right. it to, to directly seal. But remember, sealing oils are your liquid, tend to be your liquid at room temperature oils in general. Yes. Please refer to the charts. Yes. <laughs> <for anyone laughs> you said, please refer to, if you can pull up charts on um, Google charts on saturated fats, unsaturated fats, polyunsats. If you want to know what types of fatty acids are in, um, sorry, that's my daughter. She's homesick today. So <laughs> what types of fatty acids are in particular fat? So just do that research, but I would probably, if I'm sealing in, use a more liquid at, at Right. Winter. So we do not suggest a cold pressed coconut oil unless it's We're melted. Sealing. Unless yeah. it's a pre-shampoo. Yeah, a pre-shampoo treatment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, someone wants to know, is sweet almond oil a penetrating or sealing oil? It That's is a, a question. I'm gonna, saturated fat. Yeah, I'm going to go back to my chart here. Can't remember if we uh, have that one in there or not. This. Um, almond oil. Is it here? Are we here? Or almond, oil? almond oil is omega-9. So it is a, sorry, am I looking at the right one? Uh, I think so. Uh, sweet. Yes. Omega nine. So we're mono unsaturated. So we're going to be sealing or penetrating. Sealing, so sealing or penetrating. No, I'm asking <laughs> a little oh. quiz. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> that is a great it's going to be penetrating. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Penetrating. Okay. Yeah. So the higher it is, the more penetrating it's going to be. Yeah. So the more, 
the more monounsaturated oils or more saturated it is, the more it's going to be penetrating, the more polyunsaturated oils are, are going to be, um, are going to be, um, ceiling. Now, again, this chart is specific to this particular paper that I looked up, but when you look up charts online, they're not, they might not have the, it might not look like this, Got right? It. This okay. is, just, it might have the percentage of, you know, um, uh, palmitic acid, 70%. And then you've got to cross reference that with what palmitic acid is. Is it a saturated or unsaturated fat? So it might be a little bit more, uh, more work. I've tried to look for a chart that was already done that had the oil percentages, what the oil was, the, the uh, fatty acid, if it was saturated or unsaturated, this is the best one I could find. Other ones online were not so, not so, it, it didn't break it up the way I wanted it to. Uh -huh. so. That'd be an awesome chart to make, just really yeah. simple. Is it a ceiling or penetrating? Yes. And just yes. sell the oil, like without the numbers? Exactly. The general <laughs> consumer, because I look at that and I go, it's math, I can't. Yeah, you're do not, it. I don't know. Yeah. But because this is a, like a research paper, they've got the percentage here yeah. of the, yeah. But yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely would be a good job. Um, okay, next question. I have low density, high porosity, naturally white hair. Recently have been told my hair is missing the medulla. Would oils penetrate or help soften my hair? And could I actually benefit from them? Yes, oils could help soften your hair. So remember the medulla, the medulla is just like filler space um, in some hair textures. In fact, with fine hair, for most people with fine hair, it's missing that, right. which is one of the reasons that fine hair is fine. So yes, oils will still penetrate into your hair. Those, those, those penetrating oils. They will. will. But if it's, if it's like a wavy fine hair, then oils again. Yeah, they'll penetrate. Yeah, they'll but penetrate. It's just a matter of what the oil will do to the final outlook. Yeah. yeah, the final outcome of your finished wash and set. Yes. What is it gonna gonna look like? Is it gonna be? I like find this? sometimes oils can be yeah, <laughs> can weigh the hair down. It can make the hair look stringy. So you have to be careful. Yeah, how they're used in the amount. So yeah. um, the question about the shea butter making the hair feel waxy. She mentioned. No, I'm talking about shea moisture, for oh. example. I experienced okay. hair so, with shea heavy cream such as curl enhancing smoothie. Okay. So I would have to, so this, this now feeds into the ingredient list and the product formulation. That's what I was thinking. So, because I, I, I would have to pull up that ingredient list to see where the shea butter falls in that ingredient list, right? To give a, a, a good estimate as to what percentage is in there. So right. it could be other ingredients in there that are making right. the hair feel waxy and so the the product overall is making your hair feel waxy so to pull out the shea even though it says shea moisture i know for quite a few shea moisture products shea is not necessarily the second ingredient or the first ingredient right it could be somewhere in the ingredient list and there's all these other ingredients in there that are in higher concentration mm -hmm. so i would have to take a look at the ingredient list of that particular yeah. product so, so it might not be the shea butter that's in that formula it might be the f product formulation as a whole yeah, the makes the hair feel waxy exactly Exactly. Right. Yeah. Which we kind of covered a lot in our first webinar, correct? Yes. We talked, yeah. about, we talked yeah. about how, you know, it's, it's difficult to pick out a, a particular ingredient out of a formula because you don't know the percentage mm -hmm. of the ingredient in that particular formula. All you do know is when you use that product, your hair doesn't feel good. So uh, I would stop using it and I, and I could definitely take a look at the ingredient list to give an you know, an estimation of what might be making your hair feel waxy because mm -hmm. sometimes there might be waxes and oils in it. Um, heavy oils, or there could be, you know, polymers in it. I'm not quite sure, but I'd have to look, take a look at the, the ingredient list. Got it. Um, okay. Uh, last question in this chat box is, uh, what is your technique for pre-poo with coconut oil and what shampoo do you use to wash it out? I bet you, I know what shampoo you use. <laughs> so for, for pre-poo with coconut oil, what I do, because you know, coconut oil is, um, solid at room temperature. Typically, uh, in the summertime, it's going to be liquefied, but usually if you're doing it, it when it's solid, you would want to put the coconut oil, um, in a double boiler. So take the... You can scoop out the coconut oil if it's in a large tub, put it in like either a stainless steel or glass bowl. Then what you would do is you would put that stainless steel or glass bowl into a water bath on the stove. Then you would melt the coconut oil. You don't want the heat to be too high, just, just so it liquefies. And then you would put it in another bottle, um, preferably one that has an applicator tip because you're applying it throughout your hair. Mm -hmm. um, and you want to, and so when I apply products for deep conditioning, I kind of part my hair and apply it to make sure all of my hair gets covered. And then you would apply the coconut oil that way because it's going to be liquefied. Mm -hmm. I don't recommend microwaving it. I just recommend like just kind of heating it gently to liquefy the, the, um, the product. Mm -hmm. Then I put a plastic cap on my head, 
put heat on and then 30 minutes, or if I'm doing it the night before I wash, it's, it's a night before treatment. And then I wash it. it out and then I shampoo with the Earth Tones Naturals um, uh, moisturizing conditioning shampoo. To be totally transparent and honest, I really don't use a lot of other products in my hair other than my own, um, just because they work so well for me. Um, and it's not to say that I don't know how other products work, um, because when I, con when I do consultations with clients and apply products to their hair, sometimes it is other product lines, but I, I just use my own products. So that's the shampoo that I use. Awesome. So me too. I love it. <laughs> so, all right. So I've uh, closed some questions in the, the chat webinar and I'm just going to finish the questions that's in the Q and A because we're at an hour and a half now. So mm -hmm. um, I'll go through. I've got nine questions um, that are still open here. Uh, so next question, what are your thoughts about film forming humectants such as aloe vera gel, flaxseed gel, marshmallow root, and panthenol? Of film forming. We, we and film here's forming. the thing, like these and having, because I, I formulated with all of them. Um, I formulated with flaxseed. Um, I used to use flaxseed in one of the gels that I use. I didn't like it that much because it, it flaked. Now again, that's not on every hair texture. That was just on mine and a lot of other people who were using the product um, who had a specific hair type and texture. But there's nothing wrong with flaxseed gel. But there's nothing wrong with it. It's film forming. It's going to clump curls together. It typically gives like a softer hold. Just on my hair, it's not going to clump my curls together unless it's mixed with something else. So it's mixed yeah. with other polymers, right? Mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong with, with flaxseed gel for sure. Just if you're making it, um, it goes rancid very, very quickly. So you need to add, you need to, you know, make a small batch, put it in the fridge, use it in a couple days or add a, a preservative in it. And grapeseed extract is not a preservative, unfortunately. It's not. It preserves itself. It doesn't preserve other things. Mm -hmm. And so find something, like if you're making it yourself, just you know, find a way to preserve that, that flaxseed gel or else it'll go rancid. It, it goes cloudy and it yep. smells and that's how you know it's, it's gone off. And then um, you mentioned earlier that um, when products go off like that and you're still using them, then you're exposing yourself to like to more harm. Blues. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're exposing yourself to more harm. So um, just, you know, make a smaller batch, a uh, small batch of it and keep it in the fridge. It, from my experience, it's lasted in the fridge about three to five days. Five days, I'm pushing it, but um, it goes rancid really quickly, uh, that flaxseed. So that was the first one, flaxseed, right? Mm -hmm. So what's the second film former? Aloe vera uh, gel. Aloe vera gel. Now, is this aloe vera gel coming from the plant? Because the aloe vera gels that are coming from, that you purchase on the shelf are actually, it's actually aloe vera juice with another polymer, usually right. xanthan gum or gore gum. So um, you're not necessarily getting the polymer from, the gel from aloe vera, you're getting the polymer qualities of the xanthan gum or the gore gum. So right. just to clarify that, I'm just wondering if you're talking about the gel itself. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was? Uh, there's marshmallow root and also panthenol. Marshmallow root is a, it's a mucilaginous, um, a, muc a, a mucilaginous substance. It'll form a film. I have not, I have not, um, uh, worked with marshmallow root, like pure marshmallow root, mm -hmm. um, really. So I don't know if you can get the powder and you put it in water and it becomes mucilaginous. I don't know how much of a film former it is, um, as well as a uh, flaxseed or even aloe vera gel juice or you know aloe vera straight from the plant uh, i know a lot of people will put it in their products but i'm not sure if that's the extract i'm not sure if that's the the pure root or i don't know if they're using aloe vera extract and then doing another film former on top so again it's a, it's the ability to read those ingredient labels because i suspect that they're using some aloe vera extract but that's not what's causing the film forming mm -hmm. it's a film former like either xanthan gum, hydroxyethylcellulose, um, guar gum, any of the synthetic polymers that's actually doing the film forming. Mm -hmm. yeah. Got it. Um, and panthenol, did we just, did you just cover that one? Panthenol? Yeah, panthenol yeah. is not a, f yeah. okay, it can form a little bit of film, but I, again, I work with panthenol. Panthenol is more of an oily substance as the raw material. It's okay. oily and it's super expensive and the cost of panthenol keeps going up and up and up. So I know that product companies that are using panthenol are not using it as the primary ingredient in the product for film forming. They'll okay. use it for um, some type of, of smoothing of the hair at a certain percentage, but it's not the primary film former in a product. Got it. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, Debbie has a question. I have high porosity 3BC hair and I feel I'm losing lots of moisture at night. Can you talk a bit more about moisture prep for nighttime? That's Absolutely. So moisture prep at nighttime, 
Um, what you can do is you can, um, if you're, and I don't know how you normally moisturize your hair, if you use a spray bottle with a little bit of glycerin or whatever it is, but part of your nighttime um, prep or what you do at nighttime has to be sleeping either on a satin pillowcase or using a satin bonnet. I have satin bonnets. I know that Krista, I saw a video of you using a boof or whatever. I'm not quite sure if that's the same thing, if it's satin line. Not, no, it's not actually satin line, which would okay. be ideal. I have a, the great invention for that. I just, you know, need time and a hundred thousand dollars to make it. <laughs> Right. But yeah, so a buff is basically just a way to, you're really using the buff to keep your hair up, almost like pineappling at night. Um, so you use the buff to keep your hair kind of up on top of your head so that the curls, the outside of the curls or the underside of the curls might get ruined, but the top part of the curls or the top, you know, halo of frizz that normally happens when you sleep, would the hair would be kind of protected at night. So it's very easy to kind of refresh the underneath of your hair, harder to kind of get the halo away from this area. So the okay. buff just helps with that. It's kind of like pineappling. Um, it's just maybe for some people a gentler and less tight than putting the pineapple you know, elastic on top of your head. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, what I sleep with, this is my own like custom made, but it's a, it's a satin, um, line cap. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are worried about your hair getting crushed at nighttime, then don't do a cap, do a pillowcase, but mm -hmm. it needs to be satin because this is going to help keep moisture in. Absolutely. I've had people who have purchased like inexpensive ones from beauty supply stores that are actually not satin, they're more nylon. And mm -hmm. they purchased one of these and they've seen such a huge difference with moisture retention in their hair at night. So definitely getting your hair off that satin, that um, co uh, cotton pillowcase yes. is going to be ideal once you have mo properly hydrated your hair. If you're you just using moist uh, water, perhaps mm -hmm. add some aloe vera juice or some a uh, little bit of honey or glycerin mm -hmm. uh, to some of that water and add it to your hair at night to refresh it and to to add some moisture in and then it has to be locked in with something like this something else. whether you put it over your head or you sleep on it mm -hmm. uh, it makes a huge 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 difference yeah huge. and and silk is compared to satin i know satin silk is more absorbent than satin correct yes. yeah it's, it's so, more absorbent satin mm -hmm. is a synthetic material so it's made out of polyester um it definitely works in terms of keeping moisture in but some people find that if they do a satin bonnet at night it gets too hot whereas mm -hmm. silk is a natural fiber so it's going to be more breathable Mm -hmm. So either one would work. It's just, you know, silk is very expensive compared to satin. So there's a cost there, but either one, if you're, if we're comparing the two, the silk would be better because it's a breathable fabric mm -hmm. and it's not, you know, if your head's enclosed in it at night, you're not sweating. <laughs> right. Right. So, but it Although does you're, you are of, getting a bit of a steam treatment and you're yeah, sweating at night yeah, with a cap on. So well, it's so okay. well for keeping moisture in. Okay. Awesome. Um, Kristen had a question. Can you use hyaluronic acid as a moisturizer um you could it's just super expensive like i i wouldn't not that there's anything wrong with it but there are less expensive ways to get the same if not a better effect so you know theoretically you could it's just it's just re way too expensive to, mm -hmm. to do and and yes. what, what would be could. Yeah. And what would be a cheaper alternative instead of the hyaluronic acid as a moisturizer? What's a cheaper so alternative? You, so you could use the glycerin. And if you're anti-glycerin, you could use um, agave nectar is another one. Uh -huh. um, you could use honey as another one. You could use sorbitol. You could use xylitol. Xylitol you can get from the, the grocery store. Uh -huh. So any of the sugar, <coughs> excuse me, sugar alcohols are good. That's what xylitol and sorbitol are. Uh -huh. um, and any of those like kind of sweet tasting humectant type products. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and did we, and I might've missed it because I was trying to answer questions throughout. Did we really address the glycerin sensitivity? Did we come up yeah, with a I final said, answer? Yeah. I said that it just like in terms of glycerin sensitivity, unless you're allergic to it again with the protein, there's no such thing, but can your hair get hard with the use of glycerin? It just depends on the environment that you're in. So yes. And, and here's the other thing I don't recommend doing. <clears throat> I don't recommend taking glycerin out of the bottle and applying it to your hair. It has to be diluted with water. Some people have actually done that. And yeah, it is so powerful at sucking moisture that it would suck moisture out of your hair to the atmosphere. Yeah. If you use it like that, like you use it concentrated like that. So don't do that. Just put a little bit in some distilled water mm -hmm. and spray it on your hair. Mm -hmm. A little bit. Start with a little bit. I know my hair needs more, but your hair might not need as much. And just, just do, just start there and see if that makes a difference to your refreshing. Got it. So like in one cup of water, I would put 
couple drops of it. I would put, um, so I'm going to go with mils. So 200, out of 250 mils of water, um, sorry, if you have a 250 mil container, mm -hmm. let's just say like maybe 50 mils might be glycerin and the rest distilled water and then work your way up from there. So you find an amount that, that really works. Got it. Um, in terms of percentages, if you're a person that's going to do some calculations, I would start with maybe about five to 10% glycerin, maybe five on the low side. Um, you know, my hair, can, my hair can go up to like, can use about 20 to 30%, right? Glycerin. Mm -hmm. Um, but your hair might need less. So about 5%, maybe five to 10. Yeah, I think that's a great start. Yeah. Um, Lynn had a question for nighttime routines. If you want to avoid putting water on your hair before bed, what do you suggest? Can you just use a penetrating oil? You can use the oil. Um, you can use an oil, but again, you can use the oil. You could try using oil. Yeah, I was just thinking. I was just thinking, what is your nighttime routine? I'm just thinking of the, the, my clients, their nighttime routine involves sometimes respraying and retwisting and redoing a lot of stuff. So yeah. in that case, they need to add water. But if you don't want to add water, then add a little bit of a penetrating oil to your hair and then put a, a satin cap on or sleep on a satin pillowcase and see if that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Although I do find that misting with a little bit, I'm not talking about wetting it. I'm talking about misting a little does definitely help. So... Um, try that or steaming, <laughs> steaming the hair. Right, the steam the hair before bed. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I'm, yes. I'm, I love it. Yeah. Q redo is a great invention. Let me yes. tell you. Yeah. 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 Um, I think I just have three more questions, four more questions, maybe, and then we are comments are closed. Um, which I guess we didn't get too much into different company lines and what products to suggest um, for dry hair situations, dry air, sorry, dry air situations. What dry products? air. So what products have, yeah. So what products in your line specifically? So in the earth tones, naturals uh, product line, do you recommend for dry air situations? So the two moisturizers that we have, the curl quench hair butter and the curl quench coconut moisture milk. So those are the two moisturizers. You could also use the curl, the curl condition, hydrating conditioner, but it's not, it doesn't have as many hydrating ingredients mm -hmm. and the, a high concentration of oils as the quench line does. Mm -hmm. So that would be for dry hair situations. What I would also say is humidifiers had adding moisture back into the atmosphere. If your hair tends to be super, super dry and you've tried everything um, and it doesn't seem to be working, consider a humidifier. In your it, room at night kind of thing? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Along with the other tips, I, I just, I know that, that that would definitely help. I know that some people might not want to make that additional investment. And you don't have to. Um, so that's why kind of creating a human environment around your hair really helps. So that includes spraying with a little bit of water, satin cap, maybe a plastic cap, then a satin cap to create that human environment. Mm -hmm. But out of the, the Earth Tones Naturals line, it's those two products. Awesome. With respect to products though, um, the next webinar I do, I will get into prod, like other product lines mm -hmm. and how to evaluate those products and stuff like that. So um, awesome. then yeah. we can figure it out for ourselves. I mean, the, yeah. really the, the reason that we, uh, you know, got talking and decided to do these webinars was because we realized that there was, you know, a lot of misinformation. And if there's just a, a great way to kind of educate, educate the general public, whether it's a stylist or a curly girl consumer, you know, the more that we can educate ourselves, the more we can make more, um, I guess, knowledge decisions about our own hair care so you know I can't use what Susie Q uses on her hair because our hair is different but you know some general kind of guidelines or just a starting place you know mm -hmm. most people just need a starting place you know like and then they can build and experiment based on that starting point so this this has been really great um, you know to sit and talk through this um, webinar and all these questions. So um, uh, I've got maybe two more questions and then sure. I think we can sum up for the day. Yeah. Um, there was a question from an anonymous, anonymous attendee. Um, is there such a thing as cosmetic grade mineral oil and is it better for the hair? Cosmetic grade mineral oil. I know that there's United States Pharmacopeia um, oil, like mineral oil and glycerin. And that just means that um, there's a, a body that basically governs the, the, like the, the constituents of that oil, right? So it's, so it's um, under the, the USP, which means it's just guidelines that the company has to follow in order to get it to USP grade. So I would say that that would be when you're looking at um, mineral oil in the, in the drugstore, that's what you're typically going to find because you're going to find it in 
the drug section, the pharmacy section, because mm -hmm. mineral oil is also used as an emetic, right? So um, for people that um, need help vomiting for whatever reason, mineral oil is also used because of the ricin um, that's in there. Um, so you're typically going to find these ingredients or these products that can also be used from a medical perspective in the pharmacy section. Right. And that's why you'll have the USP. Got it. Right? Yeah. But cosmetic grade mineral oil, I have not seen that. Okay. I've not seen like specifically cosmetic grade mineral oil. Mm -hmm. um, different companies will have different names, different trade names for their mineral oil. So I've seen that, but I haven't seen specifically like cosmetic grade. Mm -hmm. I find all of the products that, that you're talking about, like you can buy the vegetable glycerin, you can buy witch hazel, you can buy castor oil. It's all in the band-aid section on the bottom yeah. shelf yeah. in the drugstore. Yeah. It's there, you know, if you yeah. wanted to try it. So um, next question uh, is what if your indoor air, so your inside air is the main culprit because the humidity is low all the time. So that's yeah. probably the buying the humidifier would help that situation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that would be the main, the main issue. And I do understand that, that happens. Like, I mean, I know that, um, you know, in Toronto here, um, in one week, my hair will feel different based on the, the climate inside the environment inside and outside. Um, mm -hmm. And it changes so much over the course of the day. So in the day, in the morning, um, if it's, you know, super cold outside, my hair will feel a little bit drier versus if, you know, it's going to get up to like, I don't know, 20 degrees and <laughs> start at minus 10, because that does happen in, in Canada sometimes. Mm -hmm. It, all of a sudden, through the course of the day, it, it gets more moisturized. So yes, your hair will definitely change based on that, that humidity and the temperature in your surrounding environment and outside. So it, it, if you spend time chasing that, you're, it's going to drive yourself crazy if you're in one of those environments where the temperature is constantly modifying. If you're in a stable environment where it's like it's always humid, right? Or always, you know, the, a, a very similar temperature, then it's easier to, you know, assess the dryness of your hair. Right. Um, like right now my hair is fine. I bet if I go outside and it's like, you know, whatever temperature it is right now, it's going to be a little bit, feel a little bit drier. But I get back inside, it feels moisturized. So, right. you know, it's like you can't win. But you can't, yeah, <laughs> you, you can try. You can try. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know in my house, it's a newer home and I have a system that I can actually set the humidity in the house depending yeah. on the time of year. Um, yeah. So, and then yeah, but in that situation, yes, you're right. A humidifier would be. Great. Mm -hmm. That's probably the best option. Yeah. 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 And like I say, you throw out the day. The whole idea is obviously to get moisture in our hair, um, somehow seal it in and keep it moisturized. So um, I did have a question from my side of, side of the viewer, stylist and or curly girl consumer was, um, you know, people who go, uh, for example, I know you can go a really long time between your actual shampoo wash day um, so styling, I go maybe seven days and I'm definitely washing scalp, washing hair. The further out you get from wash day, the more dry your hair is going to feel. So probably spritzing your hair at night might be able to help you extend, um, the longevity of the moisture in your hair. You know, if you're spritzing at night, would you say? Yes, that is That's true. how you're able to go so long between your wash days. Well, I don't spritz my hair at night unless and, and the only reason I go so long between washes is, is, is because of time. Mm -hmm. um, in, ideally, in an ideal world, in my ideal world, I would wash my hair once a week. But because I wash, I have three girls that I have to wash and every, their hair as well. And obviously, you know, mompreneur and everything. It just, I just don't have the time to do it. So it's in a, I'm in a situation where I don't have any scalp issues. So I don't need to wash more frequently. And because of the products that I use, I can go a longer period of time with my curls still looking somewhat intact. Now, as my hair gets into week two, yes, I'll definitely have more frizz and my hair will feel drier. And so what I would do is if I had some place to go and I didn't have time to wash my hair, I would spritz with a little bit of glycerin and water. Um, I would probably kind of reactivate the gel that's in my hair already. And I would twist my hair and then you do a twist out, and that would take me for another few days. So it's just because of the style I wear my hair in, I'm able to, I have the flexibility to spritz, restyle it, allow it to dry, and that'll take me another few days and then my hair can look fresh. Awesome. If the back is frizzy, I'll spritz it with water, reactivate the gel, retwist it, and I'll get another, you know, five days from it. So yes, you're absolutely right. But it just depends on how you wear your hair. Right. right? Like I wear my hair in, like I, I have to work a lot for my curls in terms of a twist out. So I would have to retwist to get this look for another week. But adding water will definitely add, and glycerin will add more moisture to it. Moisture, awesome, okay. 
I think we got to like 98% of the questions and we're, <laughs> we're, almost, we're pretty much at a two hour mark right now. So um, there's a couple questions that we can answer, I think afterwards. So I'll, I'll send those questions uh, privately, but I think um, we had a super informative session. We've had some people already say thank you for this wonderfully informative presentation. And thank you, Dr. Susan Walker for taking the time to create the presentation and walk us through it. Super informative. I know Curly Girls and hairstylists will find this really helpful. And I look forward to doing a uh, part three of this uh, yeah, webinar series, um, <laughs> which we'll be talking about um, ingredients, how to read, you know, um, ingredient like product labels. And yes. then that will help us, you know, better inform ourselves about choosing product in the future, no matter what the brand. And beyond that, how to, how to analyze them and assess them? Um, because I mean, there's basic guidelines, but when you get into ingredient lists, you've got to know, unless you're like a product formulator or know some stuff, you're, you'll be stumped by some lists. Mm -hmm. And I'm also hoping to get into like um, Olaplex the next time because yes. I had a flex treatment and I loved it. And so we'll talk a little bit about Olaplex and I'll definitely address silicones that will fall into um, the products as well. Right. And just, you know, um, myth busting on those ingredients that, you know, you've been told that are so terrible and detrimental for your hair. It's not all as simple as it seems. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just putting forth that information. And, and then when I, when I put it forth, you do with it what you want to. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Which I think is what curly girls do. We just, you know, like I say, you want to inform yourself and then you want to make educated decisions. And that's really what we're all wishing for is education. So thank you so much for uh, being with us today and doing this webinar. You're welcome, Krista. Great. Okay. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And this session will be available shortly on yes. YouTube and uh, you'll be able to rewatch then or finish watching if you had to tune out. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Bye.